And now, from the Marquee Media Studio inside Mark Tank, it's the Mark Haney Show. Yes, this is the Mark Haney Show, and we are on a mission to ignite the entrepreneurial revolution right here in the hometown we love. And uh, yeah, the entrepreneurial revolution, it's been ignited, but we need to continue to throw fuel on that fire. That's what's going to make Sacramento thrive. And you know what? All great change in America begins at the dinner table. We need to work from the inside out. We need to fix ourselves, right? Get our family right, get our community right. And ultimately, that begins with our young people. And today on the show, we have somebody that I think you're really going to love. We have Justin McDonald. He is the head of school at District Christian Academy, and they are driving entrepreneurial thinking within their schools. What a concept. Bring something non-traditional to our school system. So I'm really excited for you to hear uh, what Justin and his team are doing at, at the District Christian Academy. So stick around. At the end of the show, I'll talk to you about what we are doing here at the Growth Factory in building this backyard advantage. We are working from the inside out to help the Sacramento region thrive. So stick around, my friends. And now it is my pleasure to be bringing on Justin McDonald. He is the head of school at District Christian Academy. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. Glad appreciate, to be here, man. Appreciate you being here. Now, today it's going to be um, maybe a little bit different show. So District Christian Academy is an entrepreneurial venture in and of itself, yeah. but they brought you in as the head of school. Uh, so maybe tell us a little bit about District uh, Christian Academy and what it is and then why you. Yeah, sure. Great question. Um, so, so DCA is really it's a leadership academy with a focus on developing you know ethical entrepreneurial leaders, um, and we, we want our kids to learn how to learn how to think, learn how to lead, and learn how to find their purpose, and then go create value in the world. And the the result is living a life of joy and impact. So that's the benefit to students and their families. You know, it's finding that pathway where you find your your purpose, and then you're doing meaningful work. You're not just checking the boxes in high school and then checking the boxes in college and then coming out with, you know, fifty to two hundred fifty thousand dollars of debt and then you know trying to figure out what do I do with my life now. It's mm -hmm. why not ask those questions sooner? And so the skills you build, the mental Mentorships you get, the apprenticeships and opportunities you seek start to become relevant and help you get clear on what is my purpose and what are the, the things that light me up and fire me up and so forth. So we just start that earlier. So our students know when they're graduating, like I know my purpose and what my next steps are rather than I just stay on the conveyor belt of formal education. You know, it's interesting finding our purpose. There's people my age that still are searching for that purpose. Um, and so is it you feel like it maybe it's easier for a younger person to begin thinking that way versus following instruction only instead looking within to find what really matters to me. Right. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think that's that's what so many of our parents and so many of the entrepreneurs I've worked with and how many people are, have made it and are successful in the world, um, but don't don't really feel a sense of fulfillment or satisfaction in what they're doing. Right. And so we go on this quest of like, how can I do something with more meaning? I've been successful. I played the game. I'm making money, but I want to do something with more purpose, you know. And so we just what, what are the questions you start to ask? at that point in your life you start to ask what am i really good at what opportunities do i really like you know sinking my teeth into what causes fire me up and wake me up in the morning that i want to go solve what what group of people and what problems do they have that i want to go solve right so you just start exploring those things and then it's an intersection of those the skills and and uh the opportunities and the causes that fire you up so we just start we just expose and and challenge our students to start asking those things at an earlier age so they it's kind of a process of elimination you know what i'm not real fired up about that but but I really liked, you know, this part of the way my brain worked or solving this kind of problem or I like working with my hands or I'm, you know, fascinated by these types of leaders and mentors in my life. Well, you know, it's interesting because there's people out there that haven't realized that they're good at things. You go get plugged into a system, let's call it school yeah. um, or the workforce, and they don't feel uh, like they're able to tap into their gifts. I mean, I always say everybody's good at something we all yeah. have gifts it's but recognizing what they are so at, uh, at dca how do you help them discover that because they might not be a good reader or good at right. spelling or maybe yes. even memorizing in the way that 
you know, traditional school works. How yeah, do you help them? Totally. So experiential learning. You do. Okay. You do. That's the number of things. So project based, real world, relevant learning. And so um, you start with what are you interested in? Pick, pick anything, pick something you're interested in. Maybe it's something in history, maybe it's something with STEM, maybe it's something with finance or business or you know construction or fabric, anything. anything, Wow. right? And so it's this project. And then you ask, well, what do you wanna learn or what do you wanna make? And that one, hold on, you guys are K through 12, right? right? And yeah. so does this happen for a kindergartner or second grader? Okay. Yeah, so I'll give you an example. Literally, I was just, just talking with one of our, our kindergartners yesterday in our kindergarten guide. Um, the kids were, a couple of kids were fascinated with building a marble run. You know, these are four and five year olds. Marble run. Yeah. So taking, you know, wood blocks and stuff and creating a, you know, a, okay. a construct. A you pathway can, of a, a pathway, marble. A pathway, the marble, and you can make it go, you know, you can swirl it, you can go back and forth, you can do whatever. And so they're fascinated by constructing that and they'll, they'll build and play with that and learn about all sorts of things, gravity and friction and hey, this thing's not working, let me reconstruct. And and in the meantime, they're collaborating with peers. So they're learning about teamwork and communication. And this is the kindergarten, right? Um, and so then, and then we say, okay, hey, there's an appetite there. And I think that's is how we learn when there's appetite you want to feed that appetite right so you see that students demonstrate appetite now you want to feed it you want to enable it and you want to like stoke it like a fire you want to encourage it so then the question is you know hey tomorrow um you know what would it look like if maybe we did that with a matchbox car right and what if um what if you're trying to build that into like a bridge what if we built that uh, you know you've got to build something that, that spans this and all of a sudden it starts to evolve into real world relevance and these are four and fourth and you know four and five five year olds who are wow. thinking this is engineering right and so just having them realize that the things that are fun and that you're interested in and they're playful when you're young they actually are the skills and the interests that you have even as a four or five or 15 year old whatever it is there's a real world application for that thing so when those lights go on um there's something you can continue to pursue and pull that thread of inquiry or interest or passion um and we just help them do that so it's kind of like um you know going to costco and getting all the samples we just want to expose our kids to all sorts of different things and some of them are going to go that tastes good i want more of that right and then we help them and enable them you know to, to pursue that pathway more what about a kid that's um, maybe not as uh, drawn to engineering and, uh, and maybe the sciences and the gravity and all that, but maybe they're very outgoing. Their gift is in communication or singing or humor. Right. Can you can you extract that yeah. and identify that? 100% looking for those opportunities to lead, to communicate, to, to collaborate. So we've got um, we've got students that do all kinds of different projects. So. Um, are uh, we do a Monday morning kickoff every single week. And so it's kind of like a, for a Christian school, the closest thing you could think of would be like a chapel. Um, but we don't do like a boring, lame chapel. We do a production, right? And maybe there's the band there and, and there's awesome worship and there's got to be an MC. And then we bring a speaker in that gives like a the seven minute TED talk <laughs> to, to these kids about whatever the theme or the, the message is. And they're all just awesome, high level people. Um, and so our students, they put that on, right? Our, our students have learned how do we do all the AV and the st it's now a fully student run um, worship band, right? Um, and most of those are high school kids, but we've got, a, I think, an eight-year-old who can drum like nobody's business. So he's been getting mentored by our high schooler who was getting mentored by the, you know, the adult the professional drummer, and he's getting ready and, and he'll do the showcase later. Um, but the students now are, are organizing that. They're organizing and communicating with the adult speakers, right? They're um, organizing the time and the budget and using the software that puts the agenda together, right? Um, and then hosting that. We, we invite that to our, uh, all of our families come in for that. We fill the whole auditorium um, and then we live stream it and stuff. So you've got kids who are starting to learn again. What are my interests? What are my passions? And then what are the tools out there that I can learn? Because skills are, you know, creative skills, thinking skills, technical skills. But then you get these, you know, how do, what are the skills of using the different tools that will enable me to do this, whether they're, you know, um, uh, a tactile or whether they're digital. Right. So our kids are learning editing software or they're learning, you know, how screenplay software or music recording software or whatever. So it's just a matter of where you're interested in. And then starting to ask them the questions of where can you learn more? What tools do you need? What people do you need? What uh, advice do you need? And then starting to help them make those connections if they don't already have them. And I think you uh, you know we typically talk entrepreneurship on this show. And my good buddy Chris McCarley I think was part of yes. the I guess founding team of the school. And uh, he's an entrepreneur. He owns a big. A uh, good sized company based yeah. out of El Dorado Hills. They sell uh, hand hair care product and stuff. Uh, anyway, um, I understand there's entrepreneurial thinking. I mean, obviously, the way you describe the curriculum up to this point is that's very entrepreneurial thinking by the by the leadership. But what are you doing in terms of 
helping people to become entrepreneurs. Yeah, sure. So um, a handful of things, but one, we want the mindset of entrepreneurship, the idea that where, you know, where you see challenges are actually opportunities, right? Wow. There's a there's there's a, a need that can be served and then you can figure out what, what product or service can serve that. And then how do I monetize that to make it worth my time and also create new opportunities for employment, team building, and ultimately positive impact in the community, right? So that concept is the first thing, give them a new lens to see the world in. Um, and so our youngest students, uh, just, just last sprint, we work in six week sprints. You don't go a quarter or a semester, we go sprints. So they can pick specific goals, uh, attack those goals, measure and reflect on those goals, have a week off and then come back and do it again. So they kind of spiral upwards. The same way that most you know product companies or whatever mm -hmm. are working nowadays. Our, our students are doing school the way that real companies are working. So- right. um, Better it, than a lot of companies, it sounds like. Yeah, right. Uh, and the sprint model works really well. Well, last sprint, our, um, our fourth through, uh, eighth graders did a business fair. So that was there at the end of their six weeks, they're working on what's my product, what's my pitch, what's my product positioning, what's my my packaging, my labeling, my my marketing. Um, and then we did a we did a business fair. They're creating businesses. Absolutely. In the school. Yeah, they're learning right there. And they realize, hey, what were my profit margins? And how do I, you know, how do I bundle or get upsells? And so it's so cool. We don't teach them how to do an upsell. What you do is you have them build a product and then they start coming up with ideas and you start probing for questions, right? And how could you how could you maximize the value of your customer? Or how could you create recurring revenue for your customer? And so that, again, the appetite allows the guides and the mentors who are working with these students to see okay, how could you take that further? How could you make that easier? How could you get that cheaper? So that's what we did with our young students. And they drove the whole thing. It was their idea. They drove it. They organized it. And um, and then they pulled it off. I mean, they cleaned me out. I didn't know I'd, I needed all the stuff that I bought that day. You know. <laughs> and then on the high school, those students start to have more capacity and more um, more, you know, their network starts to become more relevant in real world. Um, so we've got students who are building real businesses. Um, and, and it starts with learn first learn how to make money, learn how to keep money, and then learn how to grow money, right? Wow. And so it's first just learn how to make it. So even in our application process for the high school students, um, we ask them how, like how show, tell us a time about you've how you've made money. And we've had students who they've never made any of their own money. We had a student who just applied uh, and he went out, he'd never made any money. He's a 14 year old kid, never made any money. So he went out and he flipped flipped a couch, meaning he found a used couch, reupholstered it, cleaned it and and flipped it. Um, and he made $700 on Whoa. this couch, right? We got kids who are, you know, um, whatever, flipping uh, the shoes and, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? Where they're buying shoes, they're holding it, the value's going up because it's unique and then they're right. making some crazy money on it. Um, Chris McCarley's son Parker is an awesome story. Uh, he, he got the idea last year he wanted to make jerky beef jerky and so he did product testing and product development and how thick and how dry and how moist and what flavors and then he had to negotiate with the local butcher because he was you know paying retail at first and mm -hmm. how to work his margins uh, and now he's got he's got a de whole shop set up he's got a dehydrator he's got the packaging uh, and he's he's got a very unique take on jerky I literally so I'm one of his customers and he, he learned how to turn his product and his single transaction into an automated recurring subscription revenue oh, business. Wow. Um, so he's got, what has he got? He's got 30, um, 50 customers at, thir at uh, uh, $30. No, it's 30 customers at $50. You anyway, know, he makes 18 grand a year just on auto right now. And he's only had it up. That pays I've for his I tasted school. that jerky too. Yeah. And it's good. I didn't know he had that much revenue going through the thing. It's, it's awesome. So he's learned how to use, you know, um, Stripe or Square. He's learned how to do mm -hmm. digital marketing. He's learned how to have conversations with adults um, to create, you know, to, to negotiate and to create deals. And so, you know, he's a sophomore and he, he's learning these real life skills. And the primary thing is the students learn, we, we talk about, I want to give a graduate from DCA an unfair advantage in the, in the world. That's it. So what does that mean? And there's a, a lot of variables, but I think at its simplest, the unfair advantage is confidence. Um, confidence in your capability and confidence that you can go figure anything out. And that come, you have to earn that confidence. And the only way you can earn that confidence is trying something, failing, succeeding, being resilient, but it's doing, it's accomplishing. And so that's the primary thing is go do go do and then how can we help right how can we you know support you and um you know uh, when you fall down when you're 15 it's you don't fall as far and it's easier to bounce back up than when you're 50 right so we want them to learn and build that mindset at a younger age so it's super cool seeing how our kids are making money so what's not there that would be in a traditional 
school, a public school. Yeah, most of it. Um, so when you think of a traditional school, you think of rows, you think of bells, you think of um, isolated, segmented subject matters, right? Um, and and you think of teachers, the the sage on the stage teaching at and down to you, to, uh, tests and lectures, right? And so you spend 45 minutes in a class um, with a lecture, and then you go home and you do two hours of homework uh, on, let's say, anything. But let's say it's math, it's algebra. And what has every kid in the history of math school asked? When am I ever going to use this, right? Yet, when you get into the real world, and let's say it's in business, or it's in geometry, or it's in construction, you've got to solve a real problem, and you go, you know, how much of this do I need to make a profit? Well, that's just algebra. And so now you work backwards and you're you're solving for X or you know, you're trying to create a, a predictive model or you're trying to figure out what interest rate, you know, do I create here? And so by by starting with the project, the thing that's interesting and relevant and fun, then the, the students have to reverse engineer it. Well, now what do I need to know? And so we call it just in case learning versus just in time learning. So traditional school is just in case. You pump your head full of knowledge uh, just in case you may need it someday. Um, and of course, it doesn't actually stick. Like none of it right. sticks. Uh, the best that happens is we get into a real life situation in our workforce or whatever and we go, I remember learning this, but I don't actually know this. So we go and we relearn it, we research it because now we need to know it. Um, that's about the best it goes other than just trivia. Um, but we live in a world where all of the wisdom and the knowledge of the world is a millisecond away in the palm of our hand. Literally, mm -hmm. everything is accessible. I mean, you can take courses from Harvard right now. You can read Plato right now. You can literally take master class and learn how to write a, a screenplay from the Duffer Brothers, right? The guys that are writing, uh, you know, Stranger Things. My kids are all into that right now. It's incredible. So it's not about knowledge. It's about skills. And the primary skill is, is a meta skill called learning how to learn. Learn how to learn. Being yeah. resourceful. I, I, I don't know how many uh, people I talk to that are, you know, Scott, even right over here, he he will YouTube something to figure out how to do it. And so, yeah, it's at the palm of his hand. He can figure out how to do anything. He's a smart guy and he knows how to figure it out. And I'm not saying it's all YouTube, but he's it's he's resourceful. That's exactly uh, it. That's how we are learning. That's so how adults you are learning. You learn that. Is, is, so you're teaching this to elementary school kids. Yeah, exactly. So that's that unfair advantage you're trying to give them. What about the perspective of the parent um, that says, they've already got it in their mind what they want for their child. Look, I want my kid to get a four-year degree. And, you know, they've already kind of got themselves brainwashed because of the way we grew up. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then, they, but they know you're a good school. And then the kid shows up there and they're not getting maybe the same messaging that the parent, I'm thinking like breaking the parent a little bit too yeah. from their expectation, even though they signed them up. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, it's way, totally. it's still way different. Yeah, totally. I, I think at its simplest, we talk about fit and that just wouldn't be a fit. Oh, okay. And it may not be a fit yet, you know, um, because it, you just talked about it. Uh, our mindsets become very fixed over time. And this traditional model, we um, we almost all of us were exposed to it. And the, the fun thing about entrepreneurs is most entrepreneurs are successful in spite of of their traditional education. So often it's like, yeah, I, you know, I learned how to be resilient. I learned how to play the game. I learned how to, you know, be creative, but the school itself didn't do it for me. I got out there and hustled. I got out there and sold. I got out there and got a mentor, right? Um, and uh, uh, so so that's how people real genuinely, I think successful people realize you just got to go do and you'll learn and, you know, you surround yourself with smart people that, that uh, um, will reward your sort of resilience and your drive with opportunities to prove yourself and learn new things. So when it comes to, uh, uh, those parents um, and those students, it's just likely not a fit. But it's just like any product, your your potential market, right? You've got to look and see, are they problem aware? Are they solution aware? And then are they brand aware, right? And sometimes you have someone who's, they're, they're, they're brand aware. I know about your, your school, but they aren't actually aware of what problem does our school, our product solve? So you got to be clear, what what problem are you trying to solve? And then how do you want to solve it? And is our solution a good fit for the way we want to solve it for you and your family? So we talk to them in those terms. We really want them to be thinking about what problem are you trying to solve? And if there's not a problem, don't change. But if there's a problem, here's our unique take on how we're trying to solve that problem for our students, you as a family, and our community, which the problem we're trying to solve is a handful of things. We want kids to be independent thinkers and courageous leaders. But we're trying to solve and, you know, we're trying to solve the um, the leadership vacuum that, that we've got happening in America. Do you feel like parents, generally speaking, are overly reliant on their schools? Like, look, I'm just going to drop my kid off. It's up to the school to uh, teach them what they need to know to advance to the next level. 
instead of, you know, one of my favorite quotes is behind, uh, behind my desk over there, all great change in America begins at the dinner table. Ronald Reagan said that. Wow. And I always think back to the, some of the best lessons I learned. I learned by being around my family. Yeah. And um, so maybe it didn't come from the school as much, but I see with other people in today's society that maybe we've got away from some of those family values a little bit. Yeah. Um We've been trained and we are comfortable and we've trusted traditional education. I say traditional, most of it's public, some of it can be private, but this model of learning of, I'm gonna outsource my kid's life and growth and maturity um, to someone else, right? And to someone else who claim to be experts. Um, that's, a, that's a 130 year old system. Um, compulsory education is only 130 years old. It has never existed since, since about uh, 1880. Hmm. Um, and so you gotta ask, have there ever been great thinkers, innovators, <laughs> you know, leaders uh, before 1880? Most of them came before <laughs> yes. 1880. So you gotta ask with compulsory education and you know, traditional education, um, what's its job to do? And we don't ever think, what is its job to do? And if you ask what is its job to do, then you get to ask, okay, is it doing it effectively? Would I hire? public education to, you know, to, to help my student, my kids become independent, resourceful, um, resilient um, young people who are capable to, you know, find their way, add value in the world um, and be, you know, autonomous, right? Uh, are they succeeding at that? And well, the answer is they're not. We, we are not succeeding at that. So we have become really dependent on that. Um, and so I think what's missing for, and I'm a parent of three, we've got three boys, 11, 13, and 15. Um, parenting is leadership. Parenting is leadership and not all parents, it's not, we don't always see it that way. We think, well, parenting, you know, is, uh, it's just this um, experience we have, but you've got an, an opportunity, I'd say an obligation, but an opportunity uh, to shape, right, and influence the mindset that your, your kids are gonna have and take with them and the way they see the world for the rest of their lives. Um, and you do that in those formative years. Well, we're taking those most formative years uh, and we're outsourcing it to people who don't share, who I guarantee they don't share the values you have, whatever your values are. They don't, they have their values. Um, and so our students, when you let your student go, it's 16,000 hours from K through 12th grade that you're giving your student away. Um, 16,000 hours. So the question is, you know, how well are those 16,000 hours serving, our, you know, your kids, your family? Um, and just like anything, if, if it's not serving you, if it's not doing the job that you hired it to do, why wouldn't you fire it? Right. So I think that's a, a something, a mindset that we as parents don't think about all the time. We think, well, that's just what, that's just what my kids do. Well, if it's not serving you, you're a consumer. And there's not, there haven't been a whole lot of alternatives. There's a lot of alternatives now, and DCA is is one of those types of well, alternatives. Well, let's talk about that because there's a lot of people I think that might be listening to something like this and go, "Well, I don't have access to this. I can't afford, you know, private school tuition." Um, but yet, I hear the principles. I'm drawn to the principles of what you're saying. Where might, how might I approach this when? Um, I'm really not in a position financially, or maybe even geographically, to. Sure. Uh, to, to go up to El Dorado Hills and be a part of DCA. But look, I want to adopt some of these principles. Do I just take this into my own hands? How do I do this? Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome question. Um, at its simplest, yes, you take it into your own hands. That's the that's the the affordable cost, you know, uh, uh, available way that any parent can, can handle this, um, you know, what we're doing, and that's actually what we're trying to do, is what is the playbook for this learning model? Because it's not about doing more, it's just about doing less better, more effectively. So that's the first thing, you know, if, again, you gotta ask, is there a problem that I'm trying to solve? Um, the the resources uh, for homeschooling or unschooling, some people call it, uh, where you're giving your kids these real life opportunities, the ability to connect to others, that's the, the primary thing. If you can't afford it or you don't geographically have access to something like that, then homeschool your kids. Yeah. Uh, that would be the first thing. The the next thing is um, there are uh, what there something kind of new and innovative called a micro school that are starting to pop up. And micro schools are schools like Prenda uh, and Acton Academy, and oh, they Acton, take yeah, yep, and they take this model and they're doing something similar, and those are popping up, and that's the sort of they're decentralized um it's a decentralized school model for these micro schools and those are really really effective they take the unschooling model or the home you know the unschooling model they take the montessori model of uh, being student driven and and child centered and child focused and hands-on experiential um and they start to something you can only get in montessori for example at a younger age and now they're they're allowing that to happen at older ages and the gap that hasn't been filled in the u.s at all is well what happens in junior high and high school and even in college and 
And my time over the last six years, I've been in Africa um, launching uh, universities in uh, what we call the African Leadership um, University, African Leadership Group. And it was, you know, ethical entrepreneurial leadership in Africa to try to uh, address this massive unemployment vacuum by creating leaders who are going to solve problems and create employment opportunities to create prosperity in Africa. Um, and so we were doing that at the high school and then, uh, you know, this network of um, undergraduate universities. And then we started expanding that to non-accredited accelerators. Uh, so, so people, you know, who were 19 to 28 um, could bypass college altogether, get jobs, create um, employment through digital skills like cybersecurity or, you know, development or what, you know, those types of skills that now they're, they're um, uh, employable on the global market now um, or entrepreneurship or some primary ones. So we were doing that there. And that's how I got connected with District Church was we wanted create a school that's doing this entrepreneurial, student-driven, project-based, real-world, relevant, you know, mentorships, apprenticeships. We want to do that here, um, but there's nothing that fills this gap for like that high school, junior high age. And so when we, when I started looking at it, I was like, I looked around, well, what is happening here? And we we're so excited to see schools like Acton and Prenda, um, but there's nothing really like that um, as you continue to bring it up. And so that's one of the, the gaps that we're starting to fill. So we're learning from these other schools and putting together with a, a, a comprehensive K through 12 student journey so that wow. we can start to you know instill these mindsets at an earlier age. Very interesting. We're in partnership with the city of Roseville and different municipalities. In fact, uh, El Dorado County and uh, city of Rockland. And one of the programs we're working with the city of Roseville on is called Roseville Rising for high school students. Yeah. So we're looking to infuse entrepreneurial thinking into the student population inside the high schools. Um, and so I, what I'm thinking is that, you know, what can we do? It's, it's, it's tough for a, um, anybody to just go change the public school system. We're not gonna do that. That's like beating your head against the wall. Yeah. You've gotta take it into your own hands. And these programs can be created by entrepreneurs. You know, entrepreneurs could, jump in, roll up their sleeves and make this happen. That's what we're doing with uh, yeah. with the city of Roseville. But we can take society into our own hands at, at some level because what's more important than our children? Oh, absolutely. And I think entrepreneurs make bigger, faster difference than any sort of policy or government can ever do it, right? And entrepreneurship or I should, capitalism, the free market is the the best form of, of democracy. People are voting with their dollars all the time. Yes. And so this idea of school choice is actually a big one, whether it's a formal formalized alternative or whether it's, you know, sort of a supplementary alternative. Um, how can we start exposing these these young people to seeing the world differently, to seeing opportunities and starting at the simplest, starting to think for themselves, starting to think about what do I want? Where am I going? And then reverse engineer, how do I get there? But the opposite is happening. Students are taught not to think, they're taught not to challenge, they're taught not to dream. They're taught to sit still, be quiet, do the work, right? And all of their waking hours are filled by school and then by marketers <laughs> of all the things that people want to punch punch into their heads. So it's hard to get these teenage kids to wake up and kind of come out of the cave and, and start asking those questions. When you get them to ask that question, that natural human curiosity and drive to create and to innovate and, and become, if you can awaken that, now you just stay out of the way and you sort of stoke the fire. So I think what you guys are doing sounds awesome. Well, that would be my challenge to the parents out there that there, there are a lot of people out there that sit back and play Monday morning quarterback or, you know, hey, look at this. It's, you know, they're, they sit back and take pot shots at the system, which it probably deserves that, but that doesn't get anything done, right? It right. doesn't, it's not effective to, to sit back and talk trash about what's happening. It's more effective to do something do about something. it. Yeah. yeah, what are you gonna do? Homeschool, go hands on, whatever. Uh, put them to school for their time and then when they get home, put them through your own curriculum. That's, yeah, exactly right. And um, that's that. That's what you meant, that's what I mean about entrepreneurial mindset. You know, our, our, our normal society and our traditional school, which is, what is it, what do all Americans have in common? Almost all of them came through a traditional school. So we've all got this lens that's been fixed to us. Um, so we see problems and opportunities in similar ways, uh, but entrepreneurs don't. Entrepreneurs learn how to break that off or they never that's put right. it, those glasses on in the first place. And the question is, how do I go around that? Like, how do I go around that? How do I make that better, right? right? And and so that's that's where innovation comes from is saying, it doesn't, why does it have to be that way? It doesn't have to be that way. And so um, there's that would be what I encourage parents who say, this isn't working for me. Um, there's gotta be a better way. 
The answer is there is. So you just got to ask what's not working for you and then what's out there and how are you empowered to do something about it? Just do it. Do something. You know, where I learned a lot of my lessons around entrepreneurship was really, you know, I know you're a football coach. I coach football. But on the athletic field, there it's, it's like the most real world uh, experience yeah. to... Uh, to sort things out on the athletic field. I know you have the uh, sports background. How would you compare um, learning on the athletic field to the rest of learning in life? Yeah, I love that. It's, it is, it's a perfect metaphor, right? Um, the number one thing is you're playing a game. The game has clear uh, outcomes and goals. Uh, and so then you reverse engineer, what do I need to do to win the game? So it simplifies. You don't get distracted with all the minutia. Um, you get focused on what's the vision, what's the goal, how do we get there? And now you work backwards and you start picking up you start spending your time, which is the only resource we actually all have. You start spending your time on the things that are going to allow you to do that. Football is the easiest. I coach quarterbacks also. Um, what's the goal? It's simple. The goal is to win games. How do you do this as a quarterback? You throw more touchdowns. Okay, that's it. So when we're training, where you're developing, your job is to find out how do I throw more touchdowns? So you allocate your time and your energy on looking at the film, doing the drills, building the muscles and the skills that are going to have you throw more touchdowns so you can increase your opportunity to score you know, more, uh, to score more and to win more. Um, and there's all sorts of ways that you'll do that. But if you start with, well, here's the plan, here's the, 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 the practice schedule that the coach has laid out, you could be spending all your time on trivial things that aren't actually going to get you there. Entrepreneurs do that all the time. We, we get do. so focused on this. It's like, what's the goal, man? Yes, entre entrepreneurs, like I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs and so often we get caught up in things that are not important now, right? right? So we they're important, but they're not important now. Right. Uh, if you're getting ready to, if you need to win this week's football game in order to advance to the playoffs, well, let's not let's not think about the playoffs right now. We have to win this game today. Right. Yeah, and I think entrepreneurs we do that. We take uh, we get out of focus because we're I, I don't know why we do that, but we do. Right. Um, well, so one of my favorite quotes. Um, this is in our school now too. It's by Robert Heinlein. It says, "In the absence of clearly defined goals, we become strangely loyal to daily trivia until ultimately we become enslaved by it." Hmm. So, in the absence of clearly defined goals, we become strangely loyal to daily trivia until ultimately we become enslaved by it. That's all of our lives, but that's the life of an entrepreneur. That's the life of school. In the absence of the goal, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna pick up the phone, we're gonna swipe, we're gonna do the test, we're gonna do whatever someone's told us to that's do. That's the daily saying, trivia. That's the, the daily, daily trivia. trivia is this stuff that uh, is uh, urgent, but not important. Right, exactly. <laughs> Instead of saying, well, hey, if I've got a clear goal, what clear goals do, we know this is business people, what clear goals do is they tell us what to not do. They tell us what to avoid, what opportunities to say no to, so we can get focused on creating traction. Traction creates value, it creates, it sustains us, it creates excitement, um, and of course it attracts customers, it attracts employees, it attracts, it's a talent magnet, it attracts revenue, because you're actually getting traction instead of talking about and doing and so forth. So that mindset is one of the primary things for our school too, is a bias toward action. Just go. The map appears when the car is in motion. Just pick a direction, know that I'm, I want that, but just go, and then the biggest thing is do the work. Don't sit there and talk about it. Do the work. And once you start doing the work, you're going to bump your head on something you don't know how to do. So then figure it out. And after you figure it out, you'll start to create something awesome. And after you create something awesome, don't let it go to your head. Check your ego, right? Uh, and then ultimately be a force of nature. Be a leader, right? And then you come back to, okay, what's next? Where am I going next? I've accomplished that, that Everest mission. What's the next thing? How, you know, wh how do I take my purpose, my skills, my network, you know, the, the value I've learned to create, how do I take it to the next thing? Right. So that's what we're, we're trying to do. I just think that's the journey of life. People who are up to something and living a life that is both joyful, but also impactful. And I think especially entrepreneurs, I think we vacillate between those two things. We're, we're wired to make an impact. And when you get super focused on it um, and, you know, you're not paying attention to your family, not paying attention to your health, all those different things, you're like, I'd do anything just for a job again, right? Or I do, I drop all this. If I could just, I just need more time with my family. And so we sort of pendulum swing back to, I just, let's slow it down. Let's focus on what really matters. And it's about two weekends of that. And we're itching to say, I'm, I'm built for something bigger. So I believe people that are here making an impact in the world are living in that tension of joy and impact, right? And that's what we're trying to create is getting people to get clear on. It's your impact. You define that impact. You define what joy is for you. But, you know, know that you're the driver of your own life. And if something's not working for you, change it. Yeah, we occasionally will do work in the uh, in the inner city with uh, entrepreneurs and and young people that they don't know that what you're saying to now is almost like foreign. And when mm -hmm. we start talking about things like venture capital, 
um, and just different ways of growing a business is really almost like a foreign concept sure. in some of these in some of these areas. So for me, one of the things I like about your school is because I've talked to Chris a little bit about this is you get access to people who have been there, done that, and think bigger. I think Chris's company is like the biggest company in the world for uh, hair scissors. Hair shears, yeah, right, so, and now he's got all these other product lines associated with hair products, but he thinks bigger, right? So when you're around, when you're exposed to, that's why we started this show in the first place, is like some people just aren't as exposed to the way these other people think that have been really, really successful. They just dream a little bit bigger. Yeah, that's And exactly I have to it. imagine, your students have access to some of these, to Chris and some of these people. Yeah, it's incredible. The network that we're trying to build so that when someone says, you know, I'm really interested in, uh, we had a, high, uh, a senior, I'm really interested in, I think, in, in being a dentist. Okay, great. Why don't, like, have you done anything with that? Uh, no, well, then you should go hang out with a dentist, but not a dentist because you're never going to just be a dentist. Dentists become entrepreneurs. They have to run their yes. practices. And next thing you know, they've got to know everything about being an entrepreneur. The successful ones figure that out, right? And they're not even in the dental chair anymore. They're running dental dental offices or practices and ortho orthodontistry and stuff. So we connect them with a dentist who's actually an entrepreneurial dentist and go and work for him, go and shadow him, have coffee with them. Um, and then that dentist can tell you, well, what what um, undergraduate courses should you be taking? What, what college should you be looking at? So they can reverse engineer, are you getting the right high school courses to get into that undergraduate program so you can get into the dental school because that's all that matters. No one's telling these kids that. So as soon as they, again, it starts with appetite. There's a, there's a proverb that says even the sweet Sweetest honey is loathsome to sated lips. What that means is no matter how good of the information or the value you have to offer someone, you know this mentoring entrepreneurs, no matter how good you're like, I've got something here that's gonna change your world. It's loathsome, it's, it's nobody wants it. It's hateful to sated lips, someone who isn't hungry for it. Mm -hmm. And so what we look for is when does somebody have appetite? When do they say, hey, I'm interested in this? Oh, I'm glad you asked, right? Would you, you know, would it be cool if you got to meet someone who knew how to do that? Would it be cool if we went and saw that? Or, and so we make those connections. Um, so there's an incredible network we're trying to build and that's that's a huge differentiator. But we, we wait for, um, we want them to value those opportunities ah. and seek those opportunities and raise their hand. And, they, and we wanna teach them, I'm opening my personal black book to you. So are you gonna be responsible with that, that introduction and that conversation, that relationship? Because that's a, that's a million dollar relationship I just, you know, introduction I just made. Are you going to honor that? So making sure our students can handle the basics, like showing up on time, responding, you know, to an email on time, treating somebody with the respect and honor that they actually deserve, doing your homework before you even meet them. So we're really looking at things like that. So our students start to, again, they start to see the world very differently than, you know, their peers outside of what we're doing. And so it's just, it's how do we how do we remove the veil and the pretense of school and just start to expose them to real the real life right now and that network and those mentors is one of the I think the the biggest advantages that we can really create for our our students. So what's a longer term vision for DCA? Yeah, so right now we have a hundred students. Um, that's the space that we've started, um, that bias toward action. We, we've got uh, another 12 acres that we're gonna build out and that'll be a thousand student campus. Wow. Um, so we're in the pro so we've got that land secured and we're you know starting our capital campaign to start building out those facilities. So we're gonna 10X in the next, our goal is to 10X that in the next five years and have that campus there and have those thousand students there. Um, a couple other things we wanna do. For now, our focus is on that and serving this community. But secondly, we want to start to be thought leaders in this movement, that there's an alternative and there's different ways to do this. It doesn't have to be exactly our way, but there's a problem, there's a leadership vacuum. Traditional school, traditional education is not working. It's not serving many, many families and they just don't know there's an alternative. And so starting to um, inspire and equip others who want to do something similar uh, to be able to create their own schools. And I think decentralization is one of the keys. So we'll see you know, what that looks like for us, but we wanna help create the playbook for what it is that we're doing so other people can do it. I think two of the things I'm excited about over the next um, you know, six to 12 months, one um, is if 
to get accredited, uh, you've got to get accredited by people who, who accredit traditional models. So they have traditional expectations and so okay. forth. So for us, if we're going to create change, it's about um, creating, you know, our theory of change is about creating new pathways. And I think that happens in two things. One is creating an accrediting, a third party objective accrediting body that accredits schools like this. So that's our that's the, the first step that we've got. Um, and then two, starting to build exit pathways for students who come out of these schools, right? Um, first off, all of our students, we had four graduating seniors last year. Every single one of them is in college and got a scholarship for ride scholarship to where they were going. So it's awesome to see, um, you know, those pathways are still open. A lot of parents, I think there's a myth that, oh, if they do something that's not this traditional school, are they going to have opportunities later? And the answer is absolutely. Matter of fact, they should have an unfair advantage when you come out of DCA. But two, we want to create that stamp of approval that this accreditation, um, it is more legitimate than any accreditation you're going to get because it's not from academics. If you're going to accredit a school like this, a, a, a life prep entrepreneurial school, who would be the people that decide that it's doing its job? It'd be entrepreneurs, it'd be employers, right? It's gonna be leaders and it's gonna be the customers, some of the parents. So we're starting to build that accreditation out now to create that to um, accelerate uh, other ventures like this popping up, whether they're ours or whether they're someone else's. So that, that's a big piece of that. And then, like I said, creating those exit pathways. We want our students who are up to real stuff and can add real value. We want entrepreneurs like this audience to say, I want that kid right now. And then come work in my office right now as an apprentice or a mentor or an entry level person or whatever it is. I want them working on this because I know in five years they're going to be doing some incredible stuff for us. So we want to create those exit pathways um, where DCA, it means something to colleges so that if students want to go that route, they know this kid is more equipped than any kid in the, in the U.S., but to employers, entrepreneurs, et cetera, saying these kids think the way that I want them to think and colleges aren't producing that. They're not producing that mindset. DCA is producing that mindset. So that's a big piece. And then the final one um, about the next is we're, we are limited by physical inventory of how much space a student, you know, we can fit students in, in our building. We don't want to make big schools. We want to make big people and big impact. Um, but what we can do because of technology and the, and the way the world's working is start to expand what we're doing to create a, a digital hybrid leadership academy um, that really is creating a leadership network of students like I'm, I'm talking about across across mm -hmm. the country. That network becomes one of the most important things you can have. Uh, so we're starting we're going to pilot that right now and, and uh, yeah. this fall start to expand that. To now a we give access hybrid. to a lot more people. That's exactly yeah, right. Make a bigger impact. Yep. Uh, okay. What last question? What did I not ask you? What should I have asked you that didn't come out on today's show? Um, if somebody's interested in what we're talking about, okay. which uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you probably think this way. You're like, yeah, yeah. no, I, I'm successful in spite of my traditional education. Uh, that was cer certainly you know, my experience as well. And you think, how, how do I get involved? How do I support that? How do I help that? How do I share that word or whatever? I think the primary thing is we want successful people living lives of joy and impact, which are which is this audience, right? And we know it's a squiggly line up and to the right. It's never simple, it's never easy, it's never clean, but it's always worth it. Um, we want those people mentoring our students Students giving you know, apprenticeships opportunities and you know hiring them. We want you to to train, mentor, and hire um, our students. And so that's a primary thing: expanding mm -hmm. that network. So when we've got a student who says, "I'm interested in manufacturing," "I'm interested in you know cryptocurrencies," "I'm interested in you know whatever it may be." Um, that that we we know we've got right that person is one you know phone call away and so we can start to connect our students with people who are real life practitioners in the world not theoretical you know academics. Well, Justin, I appreciate you coming on the show, sharing the story of what's going on at DCA, um, but more importantly, you're you're changing lives and you know you're doing it right here in the hometown that I love and. Um, it's only going to make Sacramento and El Dorado Hills and the rest of the region uh, stronger because of the people that are being uh, developed right there at your campus. So thank yeah. you. Uh, my pleasure, man. It's really an honor and such a great community to, uh, to be a part of. Thank you. Yep. Welcome back to the Mark Haney Show. It's great to hear the school systems innovating, right? What Justin is doing at District Christian Academy is really, really special in terms of taking our young people and helping them to think more entrepreneurially. And I think that's what's happening around the Sacramento region. We're beginning to, I guess, wake up a little bit that we're more than just a government cow town. We actually have entrepreneurial seedlings that have been planted and they're starting to blossom and they're turning into great companies. They're happening within the growth factory, they're happening in the Haney Biz portfolio companies, but these startups 
right? They start up as just like very, very fragile companies, but year after year after year, they strengthen and the most successful actually drive a tremendous amount of wealth. They drive jobs. They really create uh, incredible opportunity within our region. So I'm super excited about what's happening right now in Sacramento, really excited about what's happening with the Growth Factory. As you know, the Growth Factory is a startup accelerator with an accompanying venture fund and the backyard advantage. And that advantage is really incredible. It's the most connected community in the world for local entrepreneurs. It's really a tribe of people that, that get it. They understand the power of entrepreneurship and they want to roll up their sleeves and help out. They're invested. We have skin in the game if we live in in this town of Sacramento or in the Sacramento region. And because we understand that, we want to help. I think there's a lot of us that want to help. Well, now there's a platform where we can all work together to help the up and coming entrepreneurs of the Sacramento region. So the Growth Factory is, uh, I think we've built like, uh, invested in, 33, 34 companies now, but we've helped so many more through our partnerships with Roseville and Rockland and soon, actually we just uh, created a partnership with El Dorado County, which is where Justin McDonald, uh, you know, in his school are. So really we're, we're beginning to see people that get it and now they are understanding, oh, I know how to help now. So whether you're a municipality, a civic leader, you're an investor, you're a mentor, a subject matter expert, you know how to help entrepreneurs and you believe in the power of entrepreneurship, there's now a way to get involved. So um, one of the things that you can do is put on your calendar, uh, one of our upcoming events is October 5th at the grounds in Roseville. We're gonna have GFX. If you came to last year's GFX, you know that this is just an incredible day where entrepreneurs and investors come together to help other entrepreneurs, right? To help the help our town. And GFX is nothing short of special. Last year we had over 600 people attend. And this year we expect probably at least double that. So um, people are always asking me, Mark, how do I get involved with these things that you're doing? And it's like, well, come to our events. Growth Factory, or excuse me, GFX is one of those big events that it's easy to come, hang out if you're new to this. The other thing that we do is we have something called Hanging with Haney. That's where you can come down and hang out with me. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're wanting to bounce ideas off of people, people like me, come to our events. Hanging with Haney is a small group forum where you can come out with, hang out with me and other entrepreneurial minded people and swap stories. Uh, talk about how great we're going to be and really talk about the obstacles that we face as we try to build these businesses because it's, it's difficult and nobody builds a truly great company alone. So we want to be around other like-minded people, but people with maybe a differentiated perspective on how to build the business. So again, I want to encourage you, um, if you're listening, to to really think about maybe taking that step. Because I mean, change begins many times with a first step. If you're happy with the status quo of your business, great. Hope the stories that we share on the Mark Andy Show are inspirational and helpful. But if you're not quite satisfied, you want more, you want to grow your business, you want that business to get to that next level, well, then you need to you need to probably do something different or consider doing something different. And one of those things is come get around people that are really forward-leaning, driven, and vicious people. And I think together, we can help you to get where you want to be. Um, and if you come to a Hanging hang with Haney event, there's also an opportunity to do question and answer with me, Q&A with the guests that I might have here. And it's really a chance to sort of learn things that maybe you wouldn't ordinarily, you know, get a chance to know. It's hard to read in a book what real world entrepreneurs are doing in their day-to-day -day lives. And I think when you spend time with real world entrepreneurs, um, it's a chance to let your hair down a little bit right? Be, you be you. And, you know, we all put our pants on one leg at a time. And when you get around other entrepreneurs, it can, 
it can be quite rewarding. It can be good for your business, but I think it can be good for you emotionally and psychologically too, because there's stress associated with this job that we call entrepreneurship. So again, I wanna meet every entrepreneur in the Sacramento region. We aren't just a Rockland Roseville entity. We, we're all over Sacramento, we're all over the region. So from wherever you are, make the drive out here. It's face-to-face -face in Rockland. Occasionally we'll do these hanging with Haney's outside Rockland, but look, I wanna know you. I wanna help you. I'm gonna help entrepreneurs one entrepreneur at a time, and that means one conversation at a time. So uh, for all of you out there that are fighting a good fight for our freedom, our security, and our way of life, and for sure all you out there that are fighting a good fight for entrepreneurship, I can, uh, I can relate to what you're going through. Here at the Growth Factory, here at Haney Biz, here on the Mark Haney Show, we're never above you, we're never below you. We're always by your side. Thanks for watching today's show. My goal for every episode is that you find a takeaway, something tangible you can use in your business today. And if you have a comment about a favorite takeaway, feel free to put it in the, in the box below. And if you have a, a topic that you'd like me to bring up on the show, don't forget to let me know. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you wanna learn more about entrepreneurship. Because at Haney Biz, we are always by your side.